as a young boy, I grew up in the uh, Sequoia National Forest in the lower or uh, south Sierra Mountains in California. My father was a amateur photographer, so I remember sitting once a month, we'd sit uh, on the floor in the living room and watch home movies that he had taken all the way back to 1939. And since we were a family of immigrants from Virginia to California, he, my father used to show these home movies to help my mother feel connected with her family on the East Coast. So I was familiar with the photographic process somewhat. And I think innately knew the impact of, of, of pictures uh, and the power of pictures. In my third year of high school, I needed to have some electives in, in, in class choice, and I saw photography, so my father had passed away, and, and uh, I had been messing around with his stuff. So I took photography, and I excelled at it. So when it was time to go to college, I decided to major in photography. During 19, mid-60s, it was either Vietnam or college. I had a, an urge to want to serve my country. My family has a history in military service, and I thought it was the right thing to do. I also learned that the military was a fast track to Hollywood. Traditionally, motion picture cameramen were military trained. That piqued my interest. So I quit college, gave up my degree, and enlisted in the United States Army. And my three choices of duty were photography, photography, photography. Welcome uh, to the United States Army. And they sent me off to photographic school. And then I got chosen to go to the old Paramount Studios in New York uh, that the military had owned since the beginning of World War II. And it was a full motion picture facility uh, run by civilians. And I was trained in motion pictures for about a year and a half. By the time I got out of the army, I was so overtrained at 24 years old. I, I could have done anything in the motion picture business. Movies, commercials, documentaries, television, you name it, I could have shot it. Um, I was that well trained, I had done everything there was to do. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a Christian family, and for the 10 years we lived in Southern California, uh, we attended a, a Presbyterian church. What I remember mostly was the singing of the doxology. Um, that always moved me, even as a little boy. But of course, in the 60s, college and the military, there, there wasn't much of that. Although I did think of my spirituality on numerous occasions, being in the military, of course. Especially during training, we were training with the bayonet because we, they expected us all to go into combat. And the spirit of the bayonet is to kill. And being a part of that type of training, the hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the bayonet training especially, I used to lay in my bunk at night. It was like a mantra. I said, they can have my body, but they can't have my mind. I was willing to sacrifice my body, but not my, my soul. And one day, in the afternoon, they called the entire company out together. Uh, must have been close to 300 of us. And they called us into a formation and we had to stand at attention. And they called out my name and told me to step forward. I thought I had done something wrong. I really was upset. And the, uh, the company commander came out and then pinned a 
bayonet expert ribbon on my uniform. I was stunned. I was stunned. Uh, a bayonet expert, I'm an expert. That night, I actually cried alone uh, in my bed. And I thought, they've got my mind. They got my body, but they also have my mind. They had trained me so well, I was I excelled at this bayonet whose spirit is to kill. And still to this day, um, I think about it from time to time. I thought, how did they get inside my head? I tried so hard to resist it. I was in Vietnam in 1969 and 1970, right during the height of the war. I was chosen for this little unit that operated out of the Pentagon called DASPO, or Department of the Army Special Photographic Office. And our mission was to document Cold War activity. It was a very small elite photographic unit that operated at the behest of the president. It was, we were really his eyes and ears. We would make three month trips into Vietnam, Korea, Thailand, Philippines, anywhere in the Asia rim. We didn't wear any rank, we didn't wear insignia, we could wear civilian clothes, we could go anywhere, anytime, and film anything. They call it a chain of command. That's the command chain from me personally to the president, who is the commander in chief. My chain of command it was me, a major in Hawaii, a colonel in the Pentagon, the general of the army and the president. No one could tell me what to do other than what my assignment was. So I could go any place and film anything at any time. And of course that film footage and sound recording and all would go directly to the Pentagon. It would be viewed in the White House, in the Pentagon. And then if it was appropriate, they would declassify it and release it to the press which they did regularly. So the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of feet of film and still pictures that we took on a monthly basis in Vietnam were disseminated by and large to the press, the BBC, ABC, NBC, CBS, and uh, they have that footage in their libraries and they, they claim it as their own, but it's really it was ours. I was not a, a conscientious objector, uh, but I didn't want to be a combatant. As a photographer, that job fit me perfectly because I thought, well, I might get into the war, but uh, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll be the documentarian. I'll document what I see, but uh, I won't necessarily have to be part of the combat. What did you see? I saw everything. Um, because of who we worked for, they would want to see what was going on in, in country, uh, not relying on the news media to furnish that information. They, we had to, they had their own photo teams, us, to gather that information for them. So um, my very first job there was the investigation of the My Lai incident. They used the investigation by General Pierce to try William Cannon and some of the other commanders that were in charge of the troops that committed that atrocity. The most difficult period for me, and I think I'll need a tissue for this because it's hard to talk about. Uh, this is very strange and very unusual. The U.S. Army had never had a mortuary in a combat zone until the Vietnam War. Before that time, the casualties would have been put into cases, wooden boxes, coffins, whatever, uh, and sent to the seaside to be put aboard ships to be sent home or by rail or something like that. 
Vietnam was an was a jet age war. So you could be in and out of the country in 48 hours. Um, so the powers that be decided that they could build a mortuary in country and staff it and process the casualties there. Uh, but because it was new, they had no training films. So they needed training films for the morticians. And this 19 year old kid got the job. And this is because I had the production training. Remember I said I was oh. trained in a motion picture studio. Most of the other cameramen that were in my unit were not production trained cameramen. But I was, I knew how to light and direct and work from scripts and all about motion picture making. This is why I got the job. And um, there were two films the army wanted to make. One was a, a training film for the morticians specifically. And the other was a film called Graves Registration. They wanted to just see the whole process from casualty in the field until they were put on the plane home. So that was the most difficult thing I ever did because uh, even with the, uh, the orders that I carried that basically allowed me to do anything and everything, that process I couldn't stop. I couldn't, I couldn't put a hold on it. If I found a casualty that was, let's say, whole, that was photographically more acceptable to look at. I couldn't hold it for use the next day or five hours from now. Or the process never stopped and I had no control over it. So that dictated that I need to find new, what do I call them, props for my movie every day. So my day always be, began with my coming into the facility and there would be 12 to 24 or more casualties on processing tables in body bags. And I would have to go and unzip the body bags and go through the remains to find something that was photographically acceptable. That was, that was very hard. I mean, how do you, um, how do you get trained for something like that? How do you train somebody for that job? You don't. And it, those, images that I saw in there were etched onto the backs of my eyelids. And it took me almost 40 years to get to the point where I didn't see those images on a daily basis. And there was no one to talk to. There was nobody I could talk to that could relate to what I had seen. And that was very difficult. It was hard just to keep it in. You asked me about my spirituality. I felt like every time I unzipped one of those body bags, I released the soul of those young men. And that I somehow became a part of those, those men. And they live inside of me. And I, I swore I would always um, honor that and respect that. After that experience, uh, which went on for months on and off, I think I was what the Vietnamese called dinky down, which means a little crazy. You develop a twisted sense of humor. So I noticed that there was a dis more, more and more distance between me and my, my peers. I also used to kind of 
I wonder if I had a smell to me, which I literally think I did have. And the chemicals used, formaldehydes and all these things, they, they, they get into your pores and into your clothes. And so people would kind of shy away from you. I remember standing on the roof of the villa at night. After my experience in the mortuary during the day, I would come back to the villa and I would go up and I would want to be alone. And I would stand on the rooftop by myself and all around the horizon, as you could see the city of Saigon lying out here to the, to the west side and you could see up to the Cambodian border on the north side. I would see these flashes of light and the clouds would light up and the, you could see the tracers from air gunships shooting and you could see firefights going on. But the thing that really got my attention was the, the random rockets that would come into the city. I asked somebody, what are those, are those bombs going off in these different neighborhoods around the city? And I was told that they were rockets that were coming in. And I said, well, what are they shooting at? And they told me they, they aren't shooting at anything. It's part of the, t of the terrorism that they're trying to create in the local population. And they said, no, whether they, they don't steer these rockets. They kick them with their feet and they just fire them randomly into the city. I said, but they're killing innocent people. They're killing some of their own people. Why, why would they do that? They said, because it creates fear. I remember a day being up in the north of the country and I had seen some, some not so nice things that had occurred in, uh, after a battle. And um, I used to use helicopters to travel, like taxi cabs for me. I would put my equipment in the helicopter and I would sit in the open door on the side and the machine gunner would be here, the pilot, the co-pilot. I'd put on the headphones and I'd listen to the radio chatter and fly and sit in the doorway. It was always very beautiful. But I remember this one day, um, I think I had had it up to here with what I'd seen and experienced and I just couldn't, uh, I, I think I just was overfilled. I, I had it up beyond my eyebrows and I remember seeing the jungle and the green mountains and we were flying right at the cloud level at about 3,000 feet and part of me wanted to just jump. I mean, I didn't want to kill myself, but I just wanted to separate myself from this reality I was in. I couldn't, I couldn't relate to it at all. It was so unusual, this, this killing that was going on everywhere. And, um, indiscriminate killing, kind of like what's going on today. And um, I, had a, I had a fight with God. Uh, I think my, my faith was being tested. So I started yelling at God, you know, if you really exist, you show yourself. You don't really exist because if you did, you wouldn't allow all this to go on. You wouldn't allow these children and these women and these men and these people to just kill each other so indiscriminately like they're doing and and you do something about it, right? No one could hear me talking. I was talking out loud, sitting in this side door of this helicopter. All you could hear was the engine roar and the radio chatter and everything. But I started screaming out loud and I started swearing. I was cussing God. I was calling him all kinds of profanities and I was right at the limit and I think I was looking for a sign or something. Anyway, I got over my little tem temper tantrum by the time the helicopter landed back in Saigon and and I think I had just had it. I, I said, that's it. I, God doesn't exist. There's no God. There couldn't be. It's all a lie. And I went about my business. And the next day, 
I got a telegram from the uh, over the wire service for a, a job to do. And it was with the U.S. Army Surgeons and the Third Field Hospital, out of, or the 12th Hospital, I forget which. And what this job entailed was these Army Surgeons and nurses who were working on these casualties from the war every day, in their spare time, in their off hours, separate from their mission, in their spare time, they were going out into this, these little villages and they were finding these Vietnamese children who had different illnesses and things. And the one that we, we found when I was with these, filming these, these doctors, was a little girl who had a very severe cleft palate. And through an interpreter, they talked to her parents and told them that they could do something for this girl. And in their spare time, in their off hours, they repaired this little girl's cleft palate, these plastic surgeons. And this job lasted a, a, a week over different days. I, I filmed different segments of it. I filmed the finding of this little girl, this, her selection, her parents being informed, the surgery, the aftercare. But this experience to me was like a wake-up call from God. It was like God was saying to me, okay, you've had your temper tantrum, you've had your upset, but this is the other side. This is the other side of the human equation. Yes, there's a war going on and people are dying and they're dying horrible deaths. But on the other side, there's this humanity in the midst of all this, there's this incredible humanity going on. And no, you didn't see it, but now you do. I'm here, I'm still here, and I'm, I'm, I'm creating miracles. Because what those doctors did for that little girl truly was a miracle. Changed her life forever. And nobody asked them to do that. They did the, that, that out of their love for their fellow human beings, just for the love of, of life. And that brought me back. That brought me back to God. Brought me back to believing that there was, was still love in the midst of the worst the worst that there could be. I came home from the war in 1970. Like I was always so grateful that I survived, that my name was not etched on that wall in, in the National Mall on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. There are 58,000 900 something names on that wall and my name's not one of them by the grace of God. I remember literally stepping off of the plane and I had the very strong feeling. If I could put it into words, it's, it's there are no heroes in Hollywood. I had already seen all the heroes that I would ever need to see, and they certainly weren't in Hollywood. So the luster, the shine, the glitter of the attraction of Hollywood just was no longer there. And I worked for 30 years uh, as a freelance motion picture cameraman, and, and that feeling that I had coming home from the war turned out to be true. There was never anybody in Hollywood that impressed me all that much. And I loved my career, and I did some terrific things, but there's nothing special about it. There's nothing extraordinary about it. If you work in the movie business, you're not better than anybody else. It's like uh, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, 
Oz is just a man at a microphone behind the curtain. He's just like you and just like me. My first uh, exposure to special effects photography was in the screening room where they would, on a daily basis, uh, project what they called the dailies, the work that was done the previous day. The entire company would come in and sit down. They would show all the different pieces of film. Uh, the uh, employees, all the camera people, the technicians would sit with these little um, uh, laser pointers. And uh, as they would show the, the film, they would show it at normal speed, they would show it at slow speed, they would show it frame by frame, they would back it up, they would run it forward, run it back. And if anyone saw dust or a lens flare or uh, uh, any of the matte photography that was not aligned or anything wrong in the picture, they would point the laser pointer at the screen and say, I see that, see that. And I was so impressed at these people, the ability they had to see these little problems that I couldn't see even with the trained eye. So it took about a week to finally get in sync with this and where I could actually start seeing these things myself. But that was back in the emotion world. Now, of course, it's all digital, so it's quite, quite different. But I was very impressed with that and realized that all the years of experience that I had in photography before I got into special effects uh, had no bearing on the special effects world. It was an entire world unto itself, and it was a one-way street. Uh, hardly anything I learned in photography before applied to special effects but absolutely everything that I learned in the special effects world, I then was able to take back out and apply to the live action photography world. When the movie um, Star Wars was being made, the second film, Empire Strikes Back, was 90% done. It was ready to go to market. And uh, at the very uh, end of the production, I guess George wanted to add some more explosions, some more spaceships blowing up out in the space and so forth. Because I had the experience as a, as a cameraman in the Vietnam War and had filmed lots of explosions, I got the job. So I filmed the explosions. Um, so for weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, I blew things up and filmed it in slow motion and they ended up putting them into the movie. And then from there, I went to work on Star Trek the movie, The Wrath of Khan. I filmed uh, uh, the Star Trek Enterprise, you know, moving across the screen. I did some of the uh, the planets that are in the background. I did the star fields that are in the background. I did uh, explosions, of course, because I was good at things blowing up. And um, um, one of the most fun things was to uh, film or generate the, the warp speed effect. Uh, which was very, very, very complicated. It was a, a scientific and a extreme math problem to figure out how to make those streaks. And uh, uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun. I, have I put it behind me? Am I done? Uh, yes, I live a new, entirely new life now. In the year 2000, after a career of 33 years in the motion picture business, I finally one day um, was full. I had it up to here. I came home, I looked at my wife, I said, honey, I'm done. And she said, oh, you're done with this production? I said, no, I'm done with the movie business. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm finished. I've, I've, I think I've done it all and I'm satisfied. And she said, you mean done as in you're really done? I said, yes. <laughs> and uh, that was uh, 
going on 17 years ago. I, I walked away, I never looked back. I haven't missed it one day, not one minute. I've seen a lot of things. I've been around the world. I've filmed wars, revolutions. I've filmed Hollywood, sports, children's programming, documentaries, science programs. Uh, name something, uh, I've, I've filmed it. I've, I've, I've done just about everything you could do in the motion pictures. And I think, I believe that God gave this to me as a gift. You know, I was blinded in my right eye as a child. I caught an arrow in my right eye. And when I was six years old, they took me to the hospital, took the arrow out, told my mother and father that I was going to lose my eye. Three times they took me into an operating room to remove my right eye, and three times they took me back to my room to wait to see what would happen. And to make a long story short, my eye healed up. It was a miraculous healing because there was never any medical reason why my eye was saved. But I remember my mother, who was very religious, telling me when I asked her if I would be blind, she said, honey, God wants you to see. And I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. God saved my eye. I became a cameraman. I spent a lifetime filming things that millions of people have seen. And I think I was being used as a vessel to see for other people. I know one important thing that I want to tell you is that the camera still to this day is probably, I believe, one of the most, if not the most powerful tool known to mankind. With it, you can make a bad man look good and you could make a good man look bad. I swore I would never do that, that I would always just film what was in front of me and stay true and honest to that. That was my mission, and I succeeded at that in my career.